across multiple cancers were uh, very aware of the need to take account of the fact that patients differ, um, differ genetically, differ in the behavior of these cancers and their drug responses. And this sort of inter-patient heterogeneity, um, the best way to deal with that, best way to maximize benefit for patients is to uh, try and target those individuals using personalized therapy approaches. Um, so the aim of MIST and, and our goal really in, in mesothelioma going forward is to see whether or not we can identify, um, based on biology, subgroups that may benefit from um, individualized therapies. The approach we've taken with MIST is, is really to try and identify what could be described as low-hanging fruit in terms of these groups that I mentioned. Um, over the last number of years, there's been an increasing um, body of knowledge around the genetics of mesothelioma. And this has provided now opportunities for us to develop uh, targeted strategies. So what we've done um, with MIST is really as a first effort, I think, um, to try and stratify therapy and to deliver stratified therapy through what we call an umbrella design. This is an approach in which we will take patients um, really with, I would say, three key um, uh, molecular um, characteristics. So the first of these uh, is a group of patients that have a very common mutation, probably the most common mutation in mesothelioma called BAP1. Um, we believe or have believed that this and another alteration that we see, which is loss of a gene called BRCA1, uh, when present in patients with mesothelioma, ought to sensitize these patients to uh, a drug that's already licensed for ovarian and breast cancers called a PARP inhibitor. So patients who have the presence of these abnormalities in activation of BAT1 or loss of BRCA1, these are eligible for the first arm of this trial um, and receive recaparib. Now we've actually completed enrollment of patients into that trial and uh, we've published that data. So that's something that I'll be able to talk a little bit about um, uh, you know, to, to, to the audience. Um, in terms of the second arm, this is data now that um, we'll be presenting in ASCO uh, a little later this year. And this is now taking another very common uh, mutation which occurs within mesothelioma that affects chromosome 9, 9p21.3. Um, it's a mutation involving a gene called CDKN2A. And that mutation, we believe, will sensitize to a drug um, called uh, a CDK4-6 inhibitor. There was a number of years ago, actually, um, experiments showing that in mesothelioma specifically, when you put back the missing gene that gets deleted from the cancer, uh, you're able to actually um, uh, you know, have a very, quite, a very marked anti-cancer effect, particularly in uh, mouse models. They were able to demonstrate this. Uh, now, a number of years later, the development of this so-called CDK4-6 uh, inhibitor, this actually is a way of us replacing the gene. Functionally, what the gene that gets deleted does is inhibit CDK or cyclin-dependent kinases 4 and 6. And because that's what the gene does, but the gene is gone, we can now restore what we call phenocopy, um, that, that gene being put back by using a small molecule. So we've done that. Um, I will present uh, some images actually from patients who have responded um, to drug. So we know that there's some activity there, but as I say, we're not able at this point in time to present all that data that will be presented um, at, a, at an international conference in just over a month, I think, uh, or so. Um, now, the, the, the two other arms of the trial are immunotherapy um, treatments, and we know immunotherapy has been already shown to have uh, some positive benefits in patients with mesothelioma. That is now one of the new standards of care, or most recently FDA approved in the front line. We're interested still in the relapse setting, and we're looking at two novel combinations. One is with what is known as a um, uh, axle inhibitor, which um, is predicted to have a favorable synergistic interaction when combined with a, a PD, anti PD1 inhibitor. So, we're looking at a drug called bemcentinib with um, pembrolizumab in ARM3. In ARM4, we're using a more, I, I guess, evidence based um, uh, combination, which is the use of a VEGF inhibitor and an um, uh, anti PDL1 inhibitor, tezolizumab.
So those two will be combined in four. And in five, which is due to open very shortly, we're taking arm one drug, which is the PARP inhibitor, and combining that with immunotherapy. So it's almost evolving the therapy, actually, or taking what we think are positive results and now trying to think about um, you know, rational synergistic interactions um, for that fifth arm. Um, you mentioned the three stages, and this is extremely important because what we want to do is um, select patients either based on the molecular makeup of their tumour, so BAP1, BRCA1, P16, Inc4A. These are for arms one and two. For arm five, what we'll be doing is only selecting patients who have had shrinkage or stabilisation of their cancers uh, with chemotherapy, because that's a very useful predictor for whether the PARP inhibitor is going to work um, uh, at all. Um, and so, yes, we have this first stage of really patient identification where we receive the tissue blocks into our translational hub. We'll do the molecular profile in all the patients. Uh, and then in stage two, they'll get their treatment. We measure their clinical activity. And then in stage three, which is most exciting to me actually, is that we will be able to now look in great detail at the genetics of these tumors and begin to start correlating drug response uh, with the genotype of the patients. So we're, we're able to now, with technological advances, to conduct whole exome sequencing of these patients' tumours and um, use machine learning now to try and see whether we can uh, build some sort of model or pattern of responders versus non-responders. And by correlating this with other experiments in the lab, for example, in cells, in patient-derived explants, uh, we believe we can generate some form of universal model um, to predict sensitivity. So that third bit is, um, is still critical to the whole you know, personalized therapy story and is often, often gets missed. You know, we have many, that wasn't a pun, sorry. We have many um, trials which have happened over the years where um, you know, drugs, very unusual drugs, actually interesting drugs, have shown partial responses, really good activity in a minority of patients. We just haven't had the biology to give us any indication as to why that happened. And in thinking about future development, randomized trials, um, really trying to maximize benefit for a particular drug, an understanding of that, you know, uh, drug gene interaction is absolutely key. So that's, that's stage three. And the final thing to say is that for the immuno studies, there's a big interest at the moment in, um, in the bowel microbiome. Um, so these are bacteria within the gut. Um, there is a lot of published data now that's come out in the last few years suggesting that the uh, composition and diversity of gut microbiome, those flora in the bowel, have a profound influence on whether immunotherapies work. And so we're sequencing, um, we're conducting 16S RNA sequencing of um, bowel flora in um, arms three and four. And we'll be correlating that as well in stage three um, to see if that has a meaning, um, meaningful effect. Uh, for predicting outcomes.